These are a few thoughts by Simon Wiesenthal. Whoever still had illusions after the Reichskristallnacht, what the National Socialists had planned on the Jewish people, failed to recognize the driving force of the evil which had manifested itself at that time. Everything objectionable and wicked, every evil characteristic, was projected upon the Jewish minority. It was then easy for the perpetrators to overcome the barrier which separated life and death for their victims. Not even the children were spared. The 9th of November night was always a theme that was haunting my childhood and when I was young in Vienna. Because I was born 48, it means after the war, and Vienna was really a dark, bleak place at that time. I remember as a child, I always thought I was born in a limbo. It was like everybody seemed to be depressed. Many houses were bombed, still, and not uh, reconstructed. And uh, I never heard anybody sing or laugh. So it seemed that after the war in Austria, and I think in Germany it was very similar, People have lost the memory and have lost the ability to talk and to speak and reflect. It was too much. And I remember one day that I realized that there was a, a couple walking by our house. And they looked really different than anybody else. They were very skinny and very pale. But the way they walked was odd because they were holding each other very tight. They didn't look at anybody. They just looked at the ground and they walked by very fast. Nobody could tell me who they were. So I was very insistent as a child. They kept asking. And it was obvious for me that it would cost them so much effort to get the word out. And the word was, they are Jews. So I, I've never heard anything like that. So I said, what is that? And I got so interested because nobody would talk about something that obviously happened. I could feel it. And the same thing in school, nobody would talk, you know, nobody mentioned anything. So it became um, a passion and it was like a journey of research. As soon as I could read, I started to read the newspapers, I started to read whatever I could get. And then I found out that there were many uh, court cases going on against the people who worked in concentration camps. I remember a couple, two brothers, who were running a concentration camp. And then I read all these horrible things that they did, how they tortured people how they killed with their own hands. And then, in his court cases, these guys went free. So for me, my sense of justice as a kid was broken, because the idea that somebody gets tortured or killed, or somebody's causing pain to somebody. As a child, always that was something that haunted me. It seemed to be unbearable, especially children. So I always thought about children. And it was actually the main reason they started to paint. I was always uncertain what I should do. I started to get scared. I said, I don't fit in this society. What should I be? There's nothing. Whatever the society has to offer, I wouldn't fit in, you know? And there was this one moment when I was 18 when I suddenly thought, you become an artist, a painter. Because as an artist, it's the only, the last resort in that society, the last place where I could fit in. Because I would make my own rules, you know? I can express whatever I want to express. But still, you can have a certain impact on the society. So that was the reason I painted. It was actually not aesthetic reasons when I started. It was the idea of expressing what was my, my burden, you know, over all these years, you know. My generation had such a big problem with the past, with our parents' generation. There was such a break between these two generations. It led to the, like, student revolution in the 60s. Yes because we, we could not relate to our parents' generation and their beliefs and their belief system. And it couldn't be more foreign and absurd. I remember an interview with the number one psychiatrist of Vienna at that time, Dr. Gross. In this interview, the reporter asked him, is it true that you killed several hundred children in the war? And Dr. Gross said yes. And he seemed to be very relaxed. So the reporter said, so, so you're telling me that you injected the, the poison or something like that? He said, no. We did it very hu humane because we, we, we mixed the poison into the food. 
So the children were not even aware that they were going to die. And so when I read this interview, I was amazed. But I was much more amazed that nobody would react. Like there was not one letter to the editor, not one protest. So I phoned the news magazine and said to them, I need a page. Give me a page. I want to paint an open letter to this doctor. So the only thing I did, I read the interview again, and I just painted exactly what Dr. Gross said. Like I painted this child eating, and so I painted this plate with the food, and the child laying with the head with closed eyes in the food. And now, after this painted letter, suddenly there was a huge reaction. So people now protested, and people wanted him to be kicked out, and people started to write about it. It was another instance where I saw that with a picture you can obviously reach so much deeper. And then uh, I realized that art, for me, was a weapon. It was like a weapon to strike back. For me, the process of painting, of art, is total intuition. Like the painting Epiphany, I really wanted to recreate a Renaissance painting. And that's the only art that I knew when I was a child, because I grew up basically in Roman Catholic churches. So overwhelming. I mean, beautiful, but also scary at the same time. And it's like, when you walk in, the vibrations are breathtaking, because you feel these thousand years of history. And very often, they are very violent history. I wanted to recreate this scene with Madonna and the child and the three wise men around her. And I wanted to create a version of that in the 20th century, after the Holocaust. The picture that I found was these officers standing around the Führer and all this adoration and this respect and the dignity of these handsome officers. I used.